So this lecture is on the phospholipid bilayer, which is a main component of your cell membranes. It separates inside of the cell from outside of the cell. And so what are these composed of? Well, it's composed of phospholipids, sphingomyelins, if it's a nerve cell, uh, gangliosides, a whole assortment of these types of lipids with a head group and usually two acyl chains. So some of these phospholipids can have a glycerol backbone. Some of them have a non-glycerol black backbone, such as plasmologens. And so there's a lot of diversity in the head groups and also uh, whether or not you have a glycerol-based backbone or a non-glycerol-based backbone. Once again, this is what we're studying here. Um, lipids, um, the association of one phospholipid to another phospholipid is entirely non-covalent, as opposed to sugars where we have to have glycosidic bonds, beta-1,4 as an example, or amino acids for proteins are joined together via the peptide bond, flat and rigid. Uh, phospholipids entirely self-assemble. This is essentially uh, the exclusivity of water. Uh, the head groups will associate with the water layer and the acyl chains, uh, which are hydrophobic, will tend to escape away from water. So when this self-assembly happens, what essentially you get is a bilayer. And it's this phospholipid bilayer uh, that constitutes the barrier between inside the cell and outside of the cell. So here are some of the things that we will be talking about uh, here is um, the way the cell membrane is organized. So asymmetry basically means you may have some phospholipids in the outer layer and some phospholipids in the uh, inner layer facing the uh, cytosol. So it all depends, different head groups in different areas. So for example, choline head groups may be more on the outer leaflet versus the inner leaflet. You may have sphingomyelins, different types of sphingomyelins and uh, phospholipids be exclusively versus in one leaflet versus the other leaflet. So that is uh, asymmetry. It's not like the outer layer is all for example, plasmologens, and all the inner layer facing the cytosol is all, as an example, um, glycerophospholipids. Okay, so there's a lot of asymmetry uh, between the outer and e inner leaflet. You have to remember this is going to be a bilayer. Uh, we're also going to learn that lateral diffusion, okay, this swimming, okay, back and forth, okay, that swimming back and forth is very common. In fact, we expect it to happen. Remember, uh, the phase transition temperature of our phospholipids have to be so that they are in a fluid phase as opposed to a gel phase. You do not want your lipids to be jelly. And this type of motion does not happen. You do not have a phospholipid flip from an uh, outer leaflet facing the outside of the cell to an inner leaflet facing the interior of the cell. That just simply does not happen based on thermodynamic principles. That's something we will talk about in a slide. We'll also incorporate proteins. Proteins can be transmembrane proteins. Uh, they can also be proteins that are peripheral, that is, proteins that are situated on the top part of the outer leaflet or on the inner leaflet, the inner part of the bilayer. Um, sometimes proteins are anchored. We will not talk much about this. Um, that's called, um, again, we're not going to study this, but uh, there's farnesyl, farnesyl uh, protein anchoring to the membrane, something we will not discuss, but uh, in higher level biochemistry classes, we can talk about that. And finally, uh, something new here, when I say new, about 20 years old, uh, the bilayer may be situated with these rafts. Um, versus uh, the more conventional, about 40 years, maybe even 50 years old theory of the fluid mosaic model. So we'll touch upon that in this lecture. So uh, first of all, this is what our cell membranes look like. Uh, these are uh, head groups, and then we have two acyl chains. It's a bilayer. Um, usually, um, this is how our cell membranes are made. Um, a lot of times you'll actually see this term used a lot, liposomes. Uh, liposome more, mostly has, has to do with um, taking uh, a lipid, phospholipids, and putting them together, they will self-assemble. And that self-assembly is called a liposome. But liposome is just a circular piece of lipid that encloses some space. And inside that space, we can put genes in for gene therapy or even proteins in for protein therapy. Um, 
Again, this is really a non-biological term. Uh, what I want you to know is the phospholipid bilayer. This is how our membranes look like, but if you want to use it in a lab for packaging and for drug delivery or delivery to a target, uh, we call that a liposome, and it's composed of phospholipids self-assembling into this circular-like structure. So, again, um, we're going to hit this uh, many, many, many times, this idea of uh, phospholipids and the bilayer. Uh, one theme of this lecture is what is a no-no and what is a yes-yes. Okay, so what is a no-no, first of all, is what's called transverse diffusion. What I alluded to in the beginning of this lecture, a head group that is on the outer leaflet sort of going on 180, and now being on the inner leaflet. That just simply does not happen. If it happens, it's going to be, as your textbook says, very, very slow. The reasoning behind this has to do with uh, just simple thermodynamics. So you have to imagine this bilayer is sort of an array. It's coming towards you, it's coming behind you, it's all over in the cell, which is a spherical entity. Um, in order for one phospholipid to go from the outer leaflet to the inner leaflet, that head group has to traverse a hydrophobic interior, this sort of hydrophobic interface shown here. And that is thermodynamically not conceivable. So this idea of transverse diffusion, or otherwise known as flip-flop, is very, very uh, rare if it happens at all. Now what does happen is this idea of lateral diffusion. So uh, the fluid mosaic model by Singer and Nicholson in 1972 sort of uh, postulates or imagines the phospholipid bilayer, sort of, uh, uh, you want to call it a river or a, a pond that is briefly and very nicely moving in gentle waves. So as it's swimming, not swimming as in an Olympic swimming where you're splish splashing, but it's just a gentle, smooth wave, okay? A gentle oscillation back and forth. So in that manner, the fluid mosaic model and interspersed there are proteins. Um, in that manner, um, some phospholipids can swim or laterally diffuse, moving left or right is what's known as lateral diffusion. And that is something that happens. And obviously, this has to happen above the phase transition temperature um, of this heterogeneous phospholipid bilayer. So main theme of this PowerPoint slide is lateral diffusion, uh, very rapid, okay, it tends to happen. Transverse diffusion flip-flop is very rare. Okay. So uh, one of the emphasis that I tried to make in this lecture and the preceding lecture when we were talking about fatty acids is this idea of phase transition temperature. So looking at one lipid by itself, that one lipid has a phase transition temperature. But in a phospholipid bilayer where you have an asymmetric distribution of a wide array of different phospholipids, again, you could have glycerophospholipids, plasmologens, gangliosides, all these different lipids. You could throw in cholesterol in there as well. So it's very important in this heterogeneous mishmash of different phospholipids that constitutes the bilayer. It's very important that it be above the phase transition temperature. So this is generally where you have that fluid, okay, that fluidity, which is so important and essential for our membrane health. If it's below the phase transition temperature, as you can see in the figure on the right, the acyl chains are beginning to sort of uh, mesh. They interact with one another below the phase transition temperature, and you get something that's more of a gel state as opposed to something which is what you want, all of our chemistry happens, in the solution state. So above the phase transition temperature, what's happening here is motion. So uh, motion is manifold. You could have motion um, that is um, Around the rotational axis of the acyl chain, you could have the sort of bobbing of the head group. Um, you could have um, most of the motion is uh, in that terminal methyl group where those hydrogens are spinning really fast. So that bond motion, uh, this undulating motion, that happens above the phase transition temperature. And that's the molecular motion that we see above the phase transition temperature. And that's very important for the sustenance of our membranes. Here are two examples of phospholipids that are very, very important in the lung. So the lung is a very interesting organ. It's the site for gas exchange and for breathing to occur. And 
what helps facilitate this breathing is actually phospholipids. So the main phospholipid in the lung, about 70% or so, is DPPC. This is what constitutes the alveoli lining, which is an air-water interface. The, uh, the alveoli, there's about 300 million or so in the lung, which you can think of the alveoli as being sort of a cluster of grapes, which each individual grape, uh, the size of a micron, micrometers in diameter, um, is where breathing actually happens, where gas exchange actually happens. So it's very important you minimize surface tension to allow gas exchange to occur. So the inner lining of the alveoli is predominantly DPPC, a phospholipid. So what does DPPC stand for? It stands for a dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine. Okay, so here's the choline head group. Here's that phosphate. And the ester bond with a 16-carbon fatty acid. There's actually two 16-carbon fatty acids, and the 16-carbon fatty acids are palmitic acid. So they're esterified to a choline head group. Henceforth, that's the origin of the name dipalmatoyl phosphatidylcholine. Again, 70% or so in the lung. And the mixture of that is a little bit of POPG, which stands for, if you look at the meaning, palmitoyl oleoyl phosphatidylglycerol. So let's look at this one here. So we have a glycerol backbone, excuse me, we have a glycerol head group, not backbone, a glycerol uh, head group. Here is your phosphate. And one fatty acid here is palmitic acid. So there's where that is where the palmitoyl comes in, 16 carbons. Uh, but then um, on attached to the SN2 carbon, we have an 18 carbon fatty acid that's oleoil. Uh, but notice the double bond here. So we have a point of mana unsaturation and 18 carbon fatty acid with one double bond. So a little bit of your lung has some of this POPG. So this constitutes a very important part of the lung. This and a lot of other uh, components as well as proteins comprise lung surfactant. Uh, which premature infants do not have lung surfactant, uh, so they undergo respiratory distress because um, the genes for making lung surfactant, particularly the proteins, are produced later in gestation. Uh, but uh, what's important here uh, is not just the lung surfactant proteins. The main part of lung surfactant are these two lipids, DPPC and POPG. Problem here is that uh, in order for gas exchange to occur, you need to minimize surface tension at the air-water interface of the alveoli. So if this air-water interface is lined up by DPPC, so it's a saturated fatty acid, so the DPPC will sort of line up at the air-water interface. Well, that's fine and good. The problem has to do with the phase transition temperature because you see the phase transition temperature of DPPC is actually 42 degrees. So that is the temperature at which you go from the gel phase to the solution phase. So all of our biology has to happen at the solution phase. But if DPPC has a phase transition temperature of 42 degrees, in essence, 70% of your lung is DPPC. In essence, uh, you're breathing through jelly, and that just is very difficult to uh, manage. So that is why nature has allowed um, the introduction, particularly with lung surfactant uh, mixtures, a little bit of this monounsaturated phospholipid, POPG. So about 70% DPPC, a uh, little, little bit around 10% of your lung material, lung surfactant, is POPG. So the point of, of emphasis here is that that uh, double bond, that monounsaturated phospholipid, actually serves to lower your phase transition temperature of DPPC. So inside the air-water interface of the lung, um, the gas exchange goes through a liquid phase, not through a jelly phase. Now, it's a lot more complicated than this because lung surfactant, the inner coating of the alveoli, is not just DPPC and POPG. As I said before, there's major lung surfactant proteins, there's calcium, there's um, a whole uh, bevy of other components uh, that helps minimize surface tension and helps facilitate uh, respiratory dynamics. But the two important players here, besides the proteins, are DPPC and POPG. So to overcome the fact that this, it's very good that it packs nicely because that's what you want in the uh, for gas exchange to occur. 
it's very nice that those palmitic acid acyl change pack. The problem is the 42 degrees phase transition, phase transition temperature, excuse me. So the POPG there helps lower that significantly. So um, very, very important in respiratory dynamics. So I'm not going to test you on this, but this is um, called a differential scaling calorimetry, uh, also known as DSC, and it's a way that we measure phase transitions in lipids. So if you take pure DPPC um, bilayers, uh, you actually see a sharp transition right here at the phase transition temperature, which we stated is 42 degrees. You can just get that straight from the literature. Um, a little bit of the, this transition from gel to liquid crystalline or solution phase actually begins to happen here where some of the rotation and motion that we alluded to before starts to begin to happen. But uh, the main uh, phase transition from gel to solution, also known as liquid crystalline, happens right here at 42 degrees. So everything below this temperature is a gel, and that's how the arrangement of the bilayers occur. And everything to the right of this peak is liquid crystalline. So um, at 42 degrees, we see that with DPPC. Now, what happens if we add POPG? And let's say for every three parts DPPG, we add one part POPG. So remember, POPG has that one double bond, that point of mana on saturation. And uh, the answer to this question is that what's going to happen is that this peak here is going to shift predominantly to the left-hand side because that's what the double bond does. It disrupts packing and it lowers the phase transition temperature. Very, very crucial uh, with regards to um, lung physiology. So um, monounsaturation, diunsaturation significantly liquefy and make the bilayer more of a solution state. Again, we want it to be fluid, and okay? we don't want jelly in our lipids. So, my layer core is fluid. Okay? I really like this diagram because it really gives a snapshot of what's happening. Okay? So, this is uh, all your phospholipid molecules, uh, and this is how it's arranged. So, so, it's not really packed like sardines, but, you know, you have this kind of motion and fluidity. It's almost like they're swimming. Okay, so in the grays, you have the acyl chains. Uh, the yellows are your terminal methyl groups. We got our um, charged head groups. Um, we have a layer above and a layer below, uh, the outer leaflet and the inner leaflet, respectively. So this is the bilayer core, and which is fluid. Okay? Each of these phospholipids that constitute our plasma membrane must have a phase transition temperature. It's very important that our, our body has that phase transition temperature uh, that functions above it so that our lipids, our phospholipid bilayer, excuse me, is fluid. And, and what's happening here is all these motions that I've also talked about in the previous couple of slides back. Okay, you have this type of motion here, the uh, head group sort of bobbing here and there. Now that's kind of illustrated in the next slide. So here we have this rotation, the bonds are moving. Uh, more of the bonds are moving at the terminal uh, ends. Okay, here we have a lot of um, sterics, uh, though there is some motion. And the head groups are sort of bobbing back and forth. Okay, so uh, just want to give you a clue of what's happening at a molecular level with these bilayers. Uh, some literature calls the gel state L-beta. Okay, the L stands for lamellar. And then uh, the L-alpha is the liquid crystalline phase, also known as the solution state. So just different terms in membrane biochemistry. Uh, solution state, also known as L-alpha, lamellar alpha, also known as liquid crystalline. And L-beta, lamellar beta, also known as the gel state below TM. All right, wrapping up with this lecture, asymmetric distribution of the phospholipid is a key characteristic of the bilayer. It's something that you should know. Um, take for an example, I believe this is from rat membranes, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so if you take uh, isolate cell membranes from a rat, some typical cell from a rat, you can see here uh, the outer leaflets have a little bit more sphingomyelin. Uh, the inner leaflets have a little bit less. Uh, the inner leaflet, this would be facing the cytosol, has a bunch of phosphatidyl and banolamine. Uh, 
a little bit of phosphatidylserine. So this represents asymmetric distribution. Um, total phospholipid stays, it's even between the inner and outer, uh, but the types of phospholipids uh, can vary. Right? So asymmetric distribution, please remember that uh, as a main theme of the phospholipid bilayer, our membranes. So let's add proteins into this mixture, and uh, we're starting to get uh, what Singer and Nicholson envisioned as sort of this C. It's a C that's not rocky. Okay, it's not C that is um, turbulent, but is a, it's a C of lipids that are gently undulating. And within that undulation, you get lateral diffusion. You also get lateral diffusion of these proteins. So these proteins can take the form of something that's transmembrane. They can be peripheral. Sometimes you have sugar sticking out of the proteins. Uh, sometimes you have gangliosides, which are sugars that are attached to the um, head group of the phospholipids. So a vast array. Uh, and notice here um, these things that stick out, these sugars, they often, you know, in themes and in, in biology, oftentimes these are receptor sites. They're targets for good and bad. And, uh, you know, the bad can be toxins or the good can be some other hormone or some other uh, cellular messenger. So um, this is our cartoon version of how a typical phospholipid bilayer looks like with the introduction of proteins. And so membrane proteins are hard from a structural biology sense, really hard to capture in terms of um, what they look like in three-dimensional space because, you know, you have all these amino acids here. Some way or the other having to interact with uh, the bilayer proper. And uh, that's very hard to structurally elucidate. Uh, something that's kind of new here, um, you can imagine uh, you have a sea here, and imagine putting a raft, and you're on a helicopter. So imagine if you, in this scenario, you're on a helicopter, and you're looking down on the sea, you see a stretch and stretch of blue, which is slightly undulating because, um, you know, gentle waves, which represents your... Uh, phospholipid bilayer with some protein sticking in there. Now, in the midst of this uh, C, you're going to see a raft. Okay, imagine just seeing as you look down on your, from a helicopter view, a raft. Okay, so uh, that gave rise to about 20 years or so of, of very recent research of this idea of lipid rafts. You want to look at that raft. It's sort of an isolated subdomain of this phospholipid bilayer. Okay? So here's a um, Again, these are just cartoon models of a raft. So shown here is the C here. And if you want to look look at this sub um, domain, okay, and that's what a lipid raft is. It's actually a subdomain. And that subdomain actually is sort of enriched. It's enriched in cholesterol, it's enriched in sphingolipids. Uh, it's sort of anchored in there by a protein known as caviolin. So here you have some caviolin, uh, and um, it's just regions in the sea that's sort of isolated. And that isolation point has a lot of cholesterol. We tend to think it makes it more fluid. Uh, and sphingo, sphingolipids. Sphingolipids have, if you remember, a ceramide backbone. Uh, so this um, sort of intentional enrichment of sphingolipids and cholesterol uh, in this vast sea of uh, fluid mosaic phospholipid bilayer is called a lipid raft. You also see a lot of um, sh uh, uh, sphingolipids, but you also see a lot of uh, uh, sugars attached to these lipid rafts. Uh, you see here, you have fluid mosaic phospholipid bilayer. Okay, let me jump over here. Fluid mosaic phospholipid bilayer. Okay, right here, you have that subdomain. And that subdomain is a lipid raft. Right? So the lipid raft is actually very complicated. You can see a lot of G-protein coupled receptors are sort of isolated in these lipid rafts. Uh, they're connected, uh, they're anchored by another protein known as caviolin. They seem to have some interaction with the cytoskeleton, particularly microtubules. They seem to have some interaction with actin, again another um, uh, cytoskeleton player. Um, so it's a subdomain, it's what I really would like you to know.
It's enriched in cholesterol and sphingolipids. There seems to be some sort of a health um, uh, association with these lipid rafts in the sense that these uh, concentration of these subdomains uh, seem to be attachment sites for a lot of uh, receptors. Okay, I know for a fact that um, a lot of bacteria, particularly the toxin of Clostridium difficile, when Clostridium difficile binds, it binds to an intestinal cell where it binds to these lipid, lipid rafts. Okay, so a lot of hormones, a lot of bacterial toxins, okay, more often than not, if they're going to bind someplace, they're going to bind to a lipid raft. It's sort of like a, a recruitment. Um, imagine you're looking down, you see a sea, and in that sea there's a raft. And if you're a bacteria or if you're even a good you know, a receptor or a hormone or some second messenger, you're going to go bind to that raft. That seems to be... A, where the literature is going in terms of the prevalence and the importance of these lipid rafts. Another thing, how these were discovered about 20 or 25 years or so ago, has to do with the fact that when you isolate a plasma membrane, uh, you usually isolate it by uh, some sort of differential centrifugation. Well, when you isolate a lipid raft, uh, when you isolate a plasma membrane through differential centrifugation, one of the things that you add is the detergent. Uh, so that detergent sort of breaks up the membrane and sort of uh, teases apart the phospholipids. Uh, these lipid rafts were, uh, were originally found, uh, again, a couple of decades ago by the fact that they were detergent resistant. That is that if you uh, do a centrifugation of cell fractions, isolate the plasma membrane and add detergent, uh, you break up these phospholipids, uh, but that uh, lipid raft still remained and it still remained intact. That is, it was very resistant to uh, a detergent, which normally would break apart the fluid mosaic part of the phospholipid bilayer, but it did not break apart the lipid raft part of the phospholipid bilayer. Henceforth, more investigations uh, led us to believe that, yes, there are subdomains, there are uh, subspecializations of the plasma membrane, and we call them lipid rafts. And um, still, a lot of literature um, is out there concerning these, particularly with regards to whether pathogens preferentially bind to lipid rafts. Another summary uh, slide, this is just our wrap-up slide, uh, putting everything together. Um, you can have our phospholipid bilayer, okay, so remember membrane asymmetry, uh, no flip-flop. But yes, you can get lateral diffusion. Um, we want it to be above the phase transition temperature with all these different lipids. And then we incorporate proteins in here. So here's an example of a transmembrane protein known as glycophorin. Here, our N-terminus is situated outside of the cell, okay, away towards the outside. Extracellular region. We have a transmembrane portion predominantly hydrophobic amino acids that interact with the hydrophobic interface of the bilayer. And then we have an intracellular portion. Uh, and um, attached here are sugars. Okay, So serine and threonine are good sites for sugar attachment. That is called glycosylation. Um, and uh, this sort of summarizes everything so far that hopefully that we've gotten from this course. Uh, in terms of our proteins, primary amino acid sequence. Remember, this is going to be folded into a nice three-dimensional structure. Uh, sugars are attached, so this would be a glycoprotein. And then all of this somehow must fit in uh, into the confines of the phospholipid bilayer in such a way such as the outside is properly folded and do its job, and the inside is properly folded and do its job.